Hi, I'm Kelly Giordano with Newman's Own Foundation. In 1982, Paul Newman and his friend A.E. Hotchner had a single great salad dressing and a single great idea, that 100% of any profits made from Newman's Own products would be given away. Since 1982, Newman's Own Foundation has done just that, donating more than half a billion dollars to worthy charities around the globe. And Paul was an avid supporter of public television. He believed in the power of public television to inform, inspire, and build stronger communities. And now, we're excited to announce a special Newman's Own Foundation challenge just for NJTV. Through the entire month of March, Newman's Own Foundation will match your contribution dollar for dollar up to $25,000. So call or go online right now and we can double your donation. Any contribution, large or small, will help NJTV meet this challenge. Together we can support the essential and inspiring programming on New Jersey Public Television. Thank you. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with McCarter and English, providing legal strategies to help drive our clients' businesses forward for 175 years. And PSE and G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, NJ Transit's improvement plan. Governor Murphy's open to giving NJ Transit more state money, but rail riders can expect another summer of cancellations due to engineer shortages. The legislature's Joint Committee on the Public Schools sheds some light on an old problem, school segregation in New Jersey. Whipping the votes on weed, who's in and who's out in the days before an historic vote. Plus, it's Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Why the American Cancer Society has lowered the age to get screened. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. Tomorrow, the budget battle in Trenton officially kicks off. Tonight, we go inside NJ Transit's Emergency Operations Center, where Governor Murphy and transit officials highlighted the budget items they'd like to see passed to improve safety and service. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was there. Governor Murphy toured New Jersey Transit's so-called war room, where a wall of screens and data streams alert staff to problems, alerts that now get blasted out on social media. When last summer's engineer shortage caused a plague of canceled trains, leaving commuters stranded, Murphy ordered this operation into high gear. Much more aggressively going to com commuters, as opposed to making you find us, we increasingly are finding you. But NJ Transit's war room can't solve its chronic issues with budget and staffing. The governor's proposed fiscal year 2020 spending blueprint boosts the agency's operating budget by a net $25 million. Senate President Steve Sweeney wants $100 million more. Senator Loretta Weinberg addressed New Jersey Transit's board last week. Both Senate President Sweeney and I have questioned whether a $25 million increase in the operation of a $2.25 billion agency, which equals really to about a 1% increase, is adequate to even continue service at current levels, much less improve service. Let me say that I agree with those who would like to see us invest even more in NJ Transit. But Murphy today drew a line saying he refused to hit up the state budget surplus, which he estimates will approach $1.2 billion next year. One thing we can't do is simply look at our surplus as a pot of money to be rated. The surplus is our state's essentially rainy day fund. The governor's admittedly laboring to dig NJ Transit out of a deficit created by eight years of starvation budgets under Governor Christie. The agency's training 100 new engineers to replenish deep staff shortages. By contrast, Metro North has such a big engineer surplus, it pays some of them to stay home. Officials had hoped NJ Transit might borrow a few of those extras, engineers who used to work for NJ Transit and would require minimal refresher courses. 
Service. But Metro North said the railroads unions couldn't agree on a plan. In the training time that it would take uh, would be past the time when we have our own engineers coming up. So we looked at it, worked closely and collaboratively with them, but it didn't work. Which means as NJ Transit starts testing its positive train control installations this summer and engineers take days off, its emergency ops center will likely be tweeting a lot. I believe that the engineering class size is more of a summer risk than positive train control. Yes, is that fair exactly. to say? So in other words, we're building this pool up as aggressively as we can. Uh, but we're not going to be in the promised land by Memorial Day. NJ Transit's got six engineering classes underway, with the first class of 12 scheduled to graduate in May. That's not soon enough, though, to avoid a potential summer of hell. In Maplewood, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. New Jersey's public school system could be reshaped, not by the new budget, but by old district boundaries that impose de facto school segregation. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron covered the opening of hearings into the issue. Gary Stein is a lifelong New Jerseyan and a former Supreme Court justice. And it's for those reasons that I find it both personally and professionally embarrassing and upsetting that my state, of which I've always been so very proud, operates one of the most racially and socioeconomically segregated school systems in the entire country. The Joint Committee on the Public Schools held its first of two public hearings on school segregation. A Rutgers Law professor said people think it's a problem mainly in the South. The irony is that New Jersey, New Jersey, is more segregated than all the states of the former Confederacy. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia. It is the sixth most segregated state in the country for African Americans and the seventh most segregated for Latinos. The only states that are more segregated are New York, Illinois, Maryland, Michigan, and California. Students are required in New Jersey to go to school where they live. That's why black students tend to go to school with other black kids. All the white kids in all the areas of white concentration wake up and see the reverse. Everybody in the neighborhood's white. People of color live over there. That's just the way it is. I mean, we wake up one day and we discover that we live in a segregated neighborhood. 25% of black students attend a 99% non-white school, according to Justice Stein. He filed a lawsuit last year on behalf of civil rights groups against the state. I firmly believe that we will be successful in that lawsuit and that the courts of this state, if the state doesn't do it voluntarily, that the courts will compel the desegregation of our schools. Segregation in charter schools is even worse, Stein said. The consensus here was on integration. All children, all children learn best when they attend diverse schools and can make friends with students from different races, backgrounds, and cultural experiences. The problem with segregation is that it makes us more likely to assume that people are a certain way to stereotype how they think and who they are. It leads us to miss their full complexity. There was some my opening testimony, add segregation to the list of New Jersey's problems. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. As early as next Monday, lawmakers could vote on a controversial measure the governor's counting on for as much as $60 million in state revenue, legalizing recreational marijuana. Senior correspondent David Cruz has been following the bill's long road to get this far. It probably shouldn't have taken this long, given that the amendments to the legal marijuana bill were the basis of the agreement announced by the governor, Senate president and assembly speaker earlier this month. But the Assembly Appropriations Committee and Senate Judiciary Committee worked well into the evening to pass the amendments. For Chairman Nick Scatari, who's been the engine for the legal weed movement for years, it was time well spent. So this seemed so easy yesterday. 
Uh, well, it's a pretty big bill. Uh, we could have done it by four amendments, but we wanted to make sure that we took advantage of the full weekend to make sure that the bill was reviewed and uh, as perfect as we could get it. So yesterday's vote was a foregone, albeit slow-moving conclusion, leaving advocates and lobbyists to whip votes or speculate about headcounts as the rest of us sat around waiting for the amendments to be printed. Once we get out of the committees today, once we get out of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Assembly Appropriations Committees today, and people can actually look at the final bill, that the amended version, not something that's constantly in flux, they get to look at it, they get to have conversations with uh, you know, subject matter experts, legislative leadership, Murphy administration officials, and get their issues addressed. I think we're going to be there for Monday. That's an optimistic view. There is still plenty of opposition to legal weed. Some lawmakers are just morally opposed to the very concept and will not be moved. Supporters say the bill's not perfect and that tweaks, even to the already pretty liberal expungement of possession and distribution of up to five pounds, can be made. Administration sources say the governor has been working the phones. Uh, I won't get into specific uh, names. Uh, We still have a ways to go. There are 21 Senate votes needed and sources say the governor has moved four senators to the yes column. Cryan, Poe, Stack and Sacco. He is said to still be targeting Lagana, Sarlo, Adiego, and Gill. Four other South Jersey Democrats, Andrzak, Madden, Beach, and Cruz Perez, are holdouts. And the administration sources say they'd like to see Senate President Steve Sweeney pull them into the yes column. As for Republicans, two targets, Kip Bateman and Declan O'Scanlan, have now become solid no votes, leaving the effort short by about six votes in the Senate. It's true that no one said it would be easy, but if this effort fails, it will be a total team loss for Democrats and could poison the coming budget process, make a shutdown more likely, and cloud the political waters just in time for November's elections. So, you know, not a big deal. In the newsroom, I'm David Cruz and JTV News. To dive deeper into the story, head to njspotlight.com, where Carly Citron reports on the sticking points of making pot legal. It is an issue that's generating local community reaction. Here with all the state's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, while those lobbying efforts continue for the marijuana bill, several municipalities around the state are just saying no to adult use marijuana. The League of Municipalities says between 50 and 60 municipalities have passed such ordinances, all of which would become invalid if a state law passes. But the bill does include a provision allowing municipalities to opt out of the law. Others are taking a different approach. Atlantic City officials are scheduled to consider a resolution tomorrow that would authorize the sale of legal marijuana only if tax revenue is directed back to the city or used by the state for property tax relief, according to Press of Atlantic City. The union representing full-time professors at Rutgers University has voted to authorize a strike against the school. Now, an authorization doesn't necessarily mean a strike happens, but it is a sign of frustration over the state of contract talks, which have gone on for over a year. Rutgers has said it continues to operate in good faith with its unions, which saw their contracts expire last year. New Jersey lawmakers are advancing another bill providing a workaround to the so-called SALT deduction. This particular bill, which has been approved by the Assembly Appropriations Committee, targets business owners. It would allow the owners of certain businesses and partnerships to shift their state income tax liability to their companies. Meantime, the latest IRS stats on tax filing season show that nationwide the average tax refund is now $3,008. That is about the same as last year. On Wall Street, stocks closed mixed today. The Dow fell 26 points. And those are your top business stories. The national argument over immigration has tended to focus on how immigrants benefit from being in this country. A new report spotlights how our communities benefit by having them here. Michael Hill reports on a population that's become a cornerstone of the state's economy. The signs of international and immigrant influence on Broadway and Passaic. Here's how the mayor described it in a press call with New Jersey Policy Perspective. We often boast about the fact that you can travel around the world by uh, going through a couple of blocks in Passaic. On the block, Ichirawa, 
a two-year-old restaurant serving Alfonso Hernandez's mother's Mexican recipes. The Hernandez came from Mexico two decades ago. They still work full-time jobs at ShopRite. They did what native-born Americans do to start a business. To open up this business, we had to use uh, the money that we saved, so my credit card, uh, personal credit card money, and that's the way that we open it. But we need money like to, to grow and to make the business uh, the, the way we, we really want to. April Hernandez was blunt about the process, all the paperwork, the language barriers. It was extreme, like it was hard. The Hernandez's journey has become a familiar one in New Jersey. NJPP reports that authorized and unauthorized immigrants make up 22 percent of the state's population, but start and own almost half the businesses on Main Street in New Jersey. 47 percent in 2016, double what it was in 1990, only California has a higher percentage. The research, compiled from state, federal, university, and think tank reports, found immigrant-owned businesses contribute $4.4 billion to the New Jersey economy, almost a billion dollars from immigrant-owned Main Street businesses. Immigrant entrepreneurs own eight out of 10 dry cleaners, seven out of 10 grocery stores and bodegas on Main Street in the state. The report found while whites own 26% of Main Street businesses, Asian immigrants account for 54 percent of them, Hispanics 15 percent, of the 3 percent, Blacks 2 percent. NJPP says many come with college degrees that aren't accepted here and that and more drive entrepreneurship. Studies and uh, in particular in academia suggest that the main reason why immigrants look to open a business is because of racism that they experience because of their language barrier and their, uh, their, their status as well. The Hispanic Chamber of Commerce helps immigrant entrepreneurs from 22 Spanish-speaking countries start a business in a place still known as the land of opportunity. If you go anywhere in the world and you ask people, why are you trying to come to the United States? They will let, answer back to you because I want to start my own business. NJPP concludes New Jersey should allow unauthorized immigrants access to driver licenses because it would give them more flexibility, mobility, and buying power as customers and employees of immigrant-owned businesses. There's a study that suggests that women will benefit more because um, undocumented women are more likely to be part-time workers than full-time workers. But opponents of driver's licenses for unauthorized immigrants in New Jersey say the NJPP report changes nothing on this issue. I don't think it's a good policy to reward individuals who the first thing they did on entering our country is break the law of our country, and then you're rewarding them by allowing them to obtain a driver's license. Driver licenses aside, the NJPP report seems to make clear what many a Main Street would look like in New Jersey if it were not for immigrants starting and owning businesses. Uh, municipalities are identified by their businesses. Are their businesses growing? Are the schools doing well? Are there parks? These are all combined to make a good community. And an improved economy. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Congressional bills would ban offshore drilling in U.S. waters. New Jersey's filed suit to prevent it. And local residents are fighting the testing that would precede it. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Cape May, where more than 100 residents, local officials, and students rallied outside the Cape May Convention Hall to protest the Trump administration's advancing of permit applications that would allow the precursor to offshore drilling from Delaware to Florida, warning seismic testing would be detrimental to the state's tourism and fishing industries and harm marine life. Next to Oceanport, where a widespread fish kill was caused not by human technology, but by marine predators, thousands upon thousands of dead fish washed up in creeks along the Shrewsbury River estuary. State environmental officials say the Menhaden were chased into the shallow waters by bigger species in such numbers they depleted the oxygen supply, causing the bait fish to die off. Those that haven't been removed will be left to decompose. Finally, Cherry Hill, where some 40 parishioners and community volunteers fanned out to help 94-year-old landscape architect Ken Arnold spruce up nearly 18 hidden acres behind the Unitarian Universalist Church in time for spring. Mr. Arnold has been curating the collection of trees, shrubs, and foliage since 1962. 
Now the church wants to draw more visitors to the grounds, so its secret garden will be secret no more. And that's the Garden State Express for Tuesday, March 19th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Another New Jersey toddler has died from flu. It's the fourth flu-related pediatric death this season. State health officials say the child did have several underlying medical conditions. They're urging people who haven't had one to get a flu shot. A fourth case of measles has been diagnosed in Ocean County's ongoing outbreak. The health department says anyone who visited the base Madrash to Ferris Penka Synagogue in Lakewood March 9th or Newark Airport Terminal B March 14th may have been exposed to the highly contagious virus and should contact a doctor. After his father died of colorectal cancer seven years ago, Representative Donald Payne Jr. has pushed to increase awareness and prevention of the third most commonly diagnosed cancer in New Jersey, and now has a bipartisan resolution in Congress targeting a disease that's affecting younger and younger people. Leah Mishkin reports. Well, I was diagnosed when I was 33. Keith Lyons had his first colonoscopy in his early teens because of stomach issues. I was like, you know what, every year I'm going and they never find anything. The year he was going to skip his colonoscopy is the year doctors found colon cancer. I never expected that. Knowing how close he got to death at such a young age still brings tears to his eyes more than 15 years later. I had stage three. Um, uh, throughout my colon. Like I said, they removed pretty much most of my colon. According to the New Jersey Department of Health, about 10% of those diagnosed with colorectal cancer each year in New Jersey are between 20 and 49 years old. Health officials say that's still considered rare in comparison to older adults. But Dr. Arcardi Broder says diagnoses at younger ages are on the rise. The past five years or so, there's an alarming trend, certainly nationally. Dr. Broder says nationally, they're seeing one in seven patients diagnosed with colon cancer are under the age of 50. The American Cancer Society recently changed guidelines to require colonoscopies starting at age 45 instead of 50. While colorectal cancer is the second most common cancer diagnosed in the United States, it's also one of the few cancers that can be prevented with screening. These would be removed during a colonoscopy and checked. Sometimes the polyps will actually be malignant and they will have some cancer starting to form, but they'll still be contained and they're relatively easy to remove and treat. Um, and then if they aren't taken care of, they can develop into a localized cancer, which can then, if still untreated, can spread throughout the body. If you develop symptoms of blood in the stool or change in your bowel habits, difficulty going to the bathroom or even excessively going to the bathroom, that should really alert you to be evaluated. And probably most importantly, if you have a family history of relatives who suffered from colon cancer or rectal cancer, you really need to be very vigilant about getting to a doctor, getting tested. Keith Lyons is the father of three boys in their 20s. He stresses to them the importance of getting screened because it was screening that saved him. In New Brunswick, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Colorectal cancer is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer in New Jersey in both men and women. 
Training for new NJ Transit engineers takes up to 20 months. New Jersey schools are the sixth most segregated for black students in the nation, and more than half of New Jersey's restaurants and food service businesses are immigrant owned. If there's somebody you'd like to get to New Jersey, share. Use hashtag New Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, advocates for worthy causes line up for state funding. The budget battle begins, and NJ Spotlight examines an investigation of how the state oversees for-profit hospitals. You can sign up for the daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. See you tomorrow. J. Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than a hundred years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Have some water. Sir. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.